Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for bringing us together to study meanings of our religion that are of the utmost importance. And no matter how much it is that we study about the salah, about the prayer, it is of the utmost, utmost importance that we review regularly and that we always remind ourselves because essentially, as we've been hearing in the first session, is that prayer is the single most important thing of all of the religious life. And it is the touchstone of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is that standard, it is that measure whereby which we know whether or not we are close to Allah. We know our relationship to Allah through the prayer. And not only in terms of how serious that we take it outwardly and the degree to which that we make it a priority, but also internally, how we are in our prayer. This is the touchstone whereby which we can determine our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the other aspect of this is prayer is life. Prayer is life. And Ustad Amjad mentioned the narration of one of the Sadaf that life essentially is praying five times a day and waiting to die. There's a lot of truth in that. Because fasting, okay, that we're fasting obligatorily only once a year for the month of Ramadan and whatever super obligatory fast that we do. Hajj and Umrah, we might make that once in our life or maybe a couple other times. Zakat, that we give that once a year if we are above the nisab or zakatable amount. But prayer, we're doing every single day. Every single day. And one of the great benefits of hearing the various ayat, verses from the Quran and the ahadith, statements of our Prophet and the reports of the salaf, the righteous forebears, is that it encourages us to do what it is that we hear. We hear about the merit of a particular act of worship and it motivates us as believers. And again, we might have heard those same hadith many times, but we need to hear those regularly. And for this reason, a book like Riyad al-Salihin, The Gardens of the Righteous of Imam Nawi, which includes so many great statements of our Prophet and of course he begins almost every chapter with verses from the Quran. Of the various types of acts of worship that we have in our religious life, this is a book that we should begin and read and start again and read and start again and read and start again and read. And this is one of the very best books of all that we can read with our families on a regular basis. And you might want to have a copy of it right where the place that you pray as a family at home. And what was that mentioned as that Amjad mentioned is very important is that we should dedicate a place for prayer in our home. And all of us know, especially if you have kids, how there might be for any given prayer three or four or five jamaas. And kids are praying quickly, want to get back outside. Or kids say that they have homework or they have work to do or whatever else. And um we want to have one congregational prayer and have a set time for it. And if you can, what I would do is to try to mirror the times with your local masjid. So if prayer is at 1.30 at MCC, try to pray at 1.30 at home, if possible. And if you know for some reason that you have to push it back a little bit for various reasons, have it be calculated. Don't just be like, okay, I'll pray in some time. But if you know in your mind, okay, I can't pray right at 1.30 because whatever, something ends at 1.30, but I'm going to pray at 1.45. Your cooking, your household chores, everything else you want to, revolve around that. Make that a priority. And you will find immense, immense blessings in your life. So we're all in need of these reminders. And this book of the Ahiyah al -Madin, it's book four. And the Ahiyah al of course, is an incredibly important work that's encyclopedic in nature. There's 40 volumes, 40 books. This is book four, and it's one of the longest. But in these sessions, we're going to be focusing on the inner dimension and how to attain excellence in prayer. And the nature of the Ahiyah al is such, the thrust of it is what is called Ilm Tariq al akhirah the science of the way to the hereafter. And this is something that every Muslim needs. 
This is just as relevant right now in this moment, 900 plus years after Imam al-Ghazali, as it was in his time. Just as it was relevant to the centuries before him, because in Imam al-Ghazali's articulation of what is known as Ilm Tariq al-Akhirah, the science of the path of the hereafter, he coined this term to indicate what was the reality of the Salaf, what was the reality of those early generations, what was the reality of the life of the Sahaba, what was the reality of the life of the Tabi'een, those who came before, what was their reality? Imam Ghazali coined this term to point to that. And it's a very that far-reaching term that essentially indicates everything that someone needs to prepare for the meeting with Allah. Everything that someone needs to prepare for the meeting with Allah. And so you have the idea of ilm, which is knowledge, but here I like to translate that as science, because here science indicates that something is systematic. And this is, Imam al-Ghazali is an incredibly systematic thinker. And then you have tariq, which is the idea of traveling a path. So there's an internal motion of the heart where you can't just stand still. You have to struggle, you have to strive, you have to do your best to draw near to Allah. And then the akhirah, ultimately this is about the hereafter. Ultimately, this is about the hereafter. And subhanAllah, when we give prayer, it's the importance that we should in our life when we return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there will be nothing greater in our scales than the time that we spent praying for His sake subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the more we give preference to prayer, the more that we will then prepare ourselves to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a good state. And when uh, Ustad Amjib was concluding his session, and this is a story to encourage us all, People that preserve their prayer in life are preserved by their prayer in the hereafter. And someone had just told us a story yesterday about someone who many of these people in this community might know. And that he had mentioned that as a part of his advanced directives when he was admitted into the hospital, that if it, if it reached a state where he could no longer pray, then let him go. If he can't pray, let him go. And they mentioned that and there was uh, other asked dimensions of this story, uh, but they mentioned as an after that they uh, that took him off the medication and that he was preparing uh, to, to meet his Lord. One of the last things that he did, and he wasn't fully conscious, it was that he took his hands like this and then folded them over. And then shortly after that, returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is someone in our time. This is not someone who lived 1400 years ago, 500 years ago, 300 years ago. And so that these stories are there uh, to remind us, subhanAllah, there are people in our time too that are validated by Allah. And one of the greatest ways to be validated by Allah, to be accepted by Allah, is to take your prayer seriously. And so this is why we wanted to review these meanings, uh, first and foremost for our own selves and with all of you to remind ourselves of how it is that we can attain excellence in prayer. So in this session, we are going to be focusing on the inner states of prayer. And everyone should have the outline and they're listed there for you. And Imam Ghazali that says essentially is that you will find many people speaking about the internal states of the prayer, but in a very characteristically Imam Ghazali, a Ghazalian type way, he wants us to understand each one of them with the utmost clarity. And so he lists them, and then he'll explain each one of them briefly, and then talk about how it is that we can attain that in our prayer. So what are the six inner states of prayer that we want to be there? First of all, you have Hudur al-Qalb which is translated as presence of heart. Secondly, you have understanding, tafahum. Thirdly, you have exaltation, ta'zim. And then, awe, heba, hope, raja, and then haya, translated here as shame. And it could also equally be translated as modesty. And so, these six inner states of prayer 
or what we want to be there throughout the prayer. And so it's not that all six of these are in every single moment of the prayer. We are going back and forth between each of these states. And so he begins with Hudud al Qalb. And he says, What does it mean to have presence of heart? And he says, In Yufriq al Qalb and Ghayri Mahu Mulhabisun Lahu Umutikalimu Beh. Is that you free up the heart from anything other than the position that it's in in the prayer and what it is that someone is saying. So the essence of presence of heart is that you are aware of what you are doing and what you are saying at every station in the prayer. So in other words, is that the bodily movements of prayer, there's deep secrets in all of them. The prayer itself is combining the worship of the malaika, of the angels. And there are angels who are just standing before Allah. There are angels that aren't just bowing before Allah. There are angels that are just prostrating before Allah. And all of the different ways that the angels are glorifying Allah. And all of the different supp supplications and invocations that we're saying in the prayer represent essentially the worship of the angels collectively. What a blessing. And so that to understand that in each position there are special etiquettes that we have. There's a wisdom why we don't recite the Qur'an in the bowing position or in sujood. Qur'an is for the standing position. That in the bowing position, there's a particular invocation that is befitting for that. And likewise in prostration. So being aware of the etiquettes of standing, that we're standing before Allah. Being aware when we're bowing. Being aware when we're in prostration. When we go back into the sitting position, which is known as either the iftirash or the tawarruk position. Uh, there's difference of opinion about whether you put the left part of your rear on the ground or on the back part of your, the inner part of your left foot. Is that regardless, it's a position of respect. And we're putting our right foot like this with our toes. This is a position of utmost respect. And this is not a position that people normally sit in. If we sit, well, we're sitting cross-legged or we might sit like on our two legs, but we don't put up our right foot like that. Uh, so this is a position of adab and respect. And when we honor those positions and we're aware of them, deeply in our hearts, the prayer starts to change and come to life. And then when we combine to that what it is that we are saying, we all have to learn what it is, what we're saying in our prayers, even if we've just converted fairly recently, even if we don't know very much Arabic. We have to learn through translation. And we have to learn those meanings so at the various stages in our prayer, we can be aware of both what we're doing in the moment as well as what it is that we are saying. And so the essence of presence of heart is that we're focusing on those two dimensions at the same time, at every position in our prayer. And we don't allow our fikr, our thoughts, to stray, to think about other things. So this is the first. The second is what is called tafahum. This is simply translated as understanding, although this form in the Arabic language, the form of tafa'ul, indicates is that one strives to understand what it is that they're saying. Okay? And given that our mind does stray, it's very easy for our thoughts to start roaming. So tafahum is the process of forcing yourself challenging yourself, struggling with yourself to have fahm, to have understanding of what it is that you are doing in the moment. And Imam Ghazali says is that this is clearly a separate meaning to presence of heart because someone's heart could be present, but they might not actually be reflecting deeply upon what it is that they are saying. And he says is that, وَهَذَا maqam يَتَثَاوَتُ النَّاسِ People have various degrees when it comes to this. And that understanding the meanings of what are being recited, you could have two people saying the exact same thing, but their understandings that are very different. Someone understands it in a very basic way, others in a much more in-depth way. So if someone's saying, SubhanAllah, 
And at a very basic level, they understand that you're glorifying Allah. But someone is saying that with a higher degree of certitude, with a higher degree of knowledge of Allah. Both are saying, SubhanAllah, but one, qualitatively speaking, is much heavier in the scales because of the degree of their certitude and what it is that they witness as a believer. And so we start with the basic levels, understand that when we say SubhanAllah, when we say the various invocations associated with the prayer, is that we learn the meanings behind them. And Imam Ghazali says here, وَكَمْ مِنْ مَعَانًا لَطِيفَةً يَفْهَمُهُ الْمُصَلِّ فِي أَهْنَاءِ صَلَاتِهِ وَلَمْ يُكُنْ قَدْ خَطَرَ بِقَلْبِ ذَلِكَ قَبْلَ Is it how many people in prayer this is, of course, especially for people that are attempting to concentrate in their prayers. Understand very subtle meanings. They come to them in their prayers that they had never actually thought about before. And so because this is the greatest thing that one can do, the very best of things you can possibly do is to pray in its time. And especially in the preferred times, in the preferred manner, if possible, in a masjid, in congregation, and so forth. This is the very best of amal, and this is something throughout history. And this is we some, we have to understand all of this. The greatest scholars that have ever walked the face of this earth that made the contributions that we are still benefiting from to this day. And you could just start listing their names from the earliest period until now. You could say very comfortably that almost all of them were praying all of their five daily prayers in congregation at the beginning of the time for their whole life. That was a given. And so still to this day, you go into the Muslim world. The true ulama do not delay their prayers. They don't. This is the way they are. The prayer is the single most important thing in their life. And it's essential for their academic and scholarly pursuits. And it's very easy to think that when you that start reading, that when you are studying, when you, that, okay, I'm just going to postpone the prayer a little bit. This wasn't the understanding of the people before us who made the greatest scholarly contributions in human history. Is that prayer was pivotal in their lives. Everything revolved around that. And so they were all, and of course, they were in societies that facilitated this. There were plenty of masajid and mosques for them to attend that were that close to them and so forth. It was something that you do. You stop, right? And then you go. And Imam Sha'arani actually specifically mentions this. He says that if you're reading a book and the adhan goes off, and you think that you're going to attain more by continuing to read as opposed to respond to the adhan, he says that you haven't understood adab before Allah. Nothing is more important than the moment that you're in. In learning that, and this is unfortunately why, that if we neglect these etiquettes, knowledge can become a veil. And this is one of the very dangerous things of all, when knowledge becomes a veil. And this is the case with religious knowledge, so what about then secular or worldly knowledge? Even more so. So we want to make this a priority. And again, we have challenges in our time, but with a little bit of thought, in a little bit of commitment, you'd be surprised the very small changes that you can make that will dramatically that change our relationship to the prayer. So he's saying that prayer is this time that we spend where if we're going to receive inspiration from Allah, this is one of the most likely times for us to receive it. And he says, وَمَنْ هَذَا الْوَجْكَانَةَ صَلَاةً عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرَ we heard Ustad Amjad quote the verse in the Quran in Surah Al Ankabut after Allah Ta'ala commands us to establish the prayer. Wa aqima salah. Establish the prayer. Inna salata tanha an at fahshay wa munkar. That indeed that prayer deters, it prevents fahsha, which is all forms of indecency, and munkar, which is wrong action. Wa la dhikrullahi akbar. And the remembrance of Allah is even greater. Indicating too is that yes, you have the prayer, but then it's the remembrance of Allah that we have inside the prayer and outside of the prayer. Wallahu ya'lamu ma tasna'u. And Allah knows everything that it is that you do. 
And so there's something about prayer is that by spending time devoting yourself to Allah in those few moments, you develop a resistance that carries over outside of the prayer that helps you live the religious life. Just like in Ramadan, when you devote yourself to Allah in that special month, is that there's a blessing that carries over after the month of Ramadan to get you through the whole year. And were you not to fast the month of Ramadan, and of course if someone has an excuse, the fadl of Allah is wasa, his bounty is immense and great, were you to have fasted if you could have. But the month of Ramadan is extremely mubarak. Even if you're not fasting, there are so many different things that you can draw near to Allah Ta'ala through in that blessed month. That month gets you through the year. And you don't always feel it, because it's not something that we perceive. It's so incredibly subtle. But were someone not to have fasted, yani out of choice, you would have seen the difference in your life. So Allah Ta'ala has given us these opportunities. And just as, for instance, that if you remember Allah Ta'ala a little bit in the morning, in a little bit in the evening, He will suffice you for the times that are between them. And we heard the hadith in the previous session about praying Fajr in congregation and Isha in congregation. As if you've prayed half or then if you do both the entire night. And then another narration is that Asbaha fi dhimmatillah Bata fi dhimmatillah You are under the protection of Allah. To the extent that Hajjaj, even though that he murdered a lot of people, is that he would ask before that he took someone's life, did he pray in congregation? And even though he was doing something wrong, he didn't want to harm someone. You think that it would make more sense than that, but this is his, but they mentioned, he would ask if they had prayed Fajr in congregation. Because he didn't want to touch someone who was under the protection of Allah. SubhanAllah. And that's like the story of the brigand who was robbing a caravan. And I think it was Sayyidina Ibrahim and Adhim, if I'm not mistaken, one of the Salihin uh, that someone took some, and there was some juice that in someone's saddle. And they mentioned it to the head brigand that uh, he asked him, he says, do you want some juice? He says, I'm fasting. And so this righteous man looks at him like, you're robbing a caravan, like you're fasting? And he said that I wanted to leave a door between me and Allah Ta'ala open. I wanted to leave at least one door between Allah and I open. He's robbing a caravan, but he's fasting. And the meaning here is really deep though, because there's a lot of people that are just caught up in certain things. They just find difficulty in leaving certain things. And sometimes we as a community will not encourage them to do the good that they do, they can still do. Right? And so, years later, this pious man is in front of the Kaaba and Musharrafa. And then he looks over and he sees the brigand making tawaf. He says, is that you? And he said that, I left the door open between Allah and he accepted me. And he let me in. And this is why I never make anyone despair. And if someone's doing 99 one things wrong, just encourage them to do one thing right. Just encourage them to do the smallest little thing, the tiniest little thing. And you never know, especially in our time, given how difficult things are, is that that could be the door for them to turn to Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. So we have Hadur al Qalb, which is presence of heart. You're focusing on what you're saying and what you're doing throughout your prayer. Then you have tafahum, which specifically is not only your presence of heart, but you are striving to understand the meaning about what it is that you are saying. And then the third inner state is what is called ta'zim. This is a very important word. I usually like to try to translate it as exaltation. It can also be translated as magnification, there are different ways that you could translate this word, but I like exaltation. And this is a meaning that is beyond both presence of heart and understanding. 
He said, because you could speak to someone, Imam Ghazali always gives us metaphors to understand things. He says, you could speak to someone, but you might not have ta'zeem in your heart for the person that you're speaking to. You're not be, you might not be honoring them or exalting them. And it's important to say here is that one of the most fundamental principles of the religion is to do what is called and to alzam ma alzam Allah. Is that we exalt what Allah has exalted. So we have to differentiate here between ta'zim and ibadah. There's a difference. When it comes to Allah, we exalt Him and we worship Him. When it comes to His creation, we exalt what He has told us to exalt, but we don't worship it. So we exalt the Kaaba, we don't worship it. We exalt the Masjid, but we don't worship it. We exalt Sayyidina Muhammad but of course, we don't worship him. So there's a difference between worship, which is in addition to exaltation that you are that worshiping the one worshiped. But exaltation is that state of heart that relates to respect, that relates to honoring. And the meanings of exaltation is that there are certain things that you don't do because the sanctity of what it is that you're exalting. There's certain things you don't do in front of the Kaaba. There's certain things that you don't do to your parents. There's certain things you don't say to your parents. There's certain things you don't do. A masjid is not a place for dunya we talk. A masjid is not a place for buying and selling. Uh, a masjid is not a place for that political discourse. That the masjid is the place to connect you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yes, that in sermons and in classes, if you want to, to have clarity on certain matters, that yes, that part of knowledge is to clarify. But a masjid is a place to connect you to Allah primarily. And there are certain things that shouldn't be done in the masjid. They have to be done outside the masjid. And so forth and so on. So ta'deem is beyond presence of heart and understanding. It's where even though we are doing something in the position before Allah, and we are saying various things, we're in a state of munaja, of intimate conversation, there's also ta'deem is that we are exalting Allah wa ta'ala. And when we're in the bowing position, of course, we're saying, Subhan Rabbi al that glory be to my Lord, the Alim, the Great. And think about every time that we say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, is that Ta'zim? Who are we standing before? We remember that story that Osad Amjad told us about Sayyidina Ali Zain Abidin, the great grandson of our Prophet. He was preparing himself to stand before Allah. And the more we prepare while we're making wudu, the more that we'll be prepared when we say that initial takbir. We want to start preparing from the time of wudu. Is that we are now washing ourselves and putting water on our body to cleanse ourselves and to purify ourselves outwardly and then more importantly, inwardly, to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ultimately, it is only the purified who will be given access to the Qur'an. لا يمسه إلا المطهرون is that outwardly you have to be in a state of wudu to hold the mushaf. But in order to access its meanings, you have to have a pure heart. And this is what, pure, this is what purification does. And our Prophet told us about wudu, is that when you perform wudu, is that your sins leave your body hatta takhruja min alfarah, until that they come out of your fingernails. And there are some of the pious, and they actually mentioned this, Imam al-Sha'arani mentions this about Imam Abu Hanifa, is that he used to have the ability to look at water that people made wudu from, and he could see the traces of sin in the water, because it washes it off, khalas. And that's a, you don't want to see people's sins. And think about how hard it is to maintain a good opinion of someone if you see them do some form of abomination. And so imagine that being aware of that. For others, they could smell the stench, the filthy stench of sin. Because we know through prophetic narration is that, uh, that someone will say a kadab, a lie, and that the angels will that move away from that person that a mile or some large distance because of the foulness of the stench of that particular that sin that was committed, something, some lie that they said. So this is the nature of disobedience, is that it stinks. There's a huge stench to it. Now we always don't smell it, 
But as we become more spiritually aware and in tune, is that this is something that some people are afflicted with. So ta'deen is to exalt. So we have presence of heart. We have a focusing on the underst on understanding what it is that we're saying. And as we're saying it, we have ta'deen. And then there's an additional meaning that is even beyond that. And this is what he calls heiba. Heiba we've translated here as awe, but really Imam Ghazali speaks of it here as uh, closer to fear. So really what it is, is it is a khawf man sha'ahu ta'zim. It is a type of fear that comes from our exaltation of uh, whatever it is that we are exalting. And so naturally, uh, if we are, if something is truly great, there's a fear that someone might have. There's a fear that someone might have. And that fear is related to having bad adab, bad etiquette, in relation to the greatness of the sanctity of what it is that we are exalting. So that in a sense that having ta'lim for a masjid and exalting it, a masjid is a masjid, even if this was previously a business park in some office space, is it now that it has become a waqf and ultimately then it belongs to Allah. It doesn't belong to anyone in the community. You have a board of trustees and executive committee who are running it. But anything that has become a waqf belongs to Allah. And it has a special nisbah and a special affiliation as a result once it is turned into a masjid. So it requires ta'deem. And then as a result, there has to be khawf, there has to be a bit of fear. Because if someone falls short in their adab and their etiquette in relation to that which must be exalted, they could get themselves in trouble. And that it could that prevent them from drawing near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So heiba is a type of awe that comes from fear. And, or you could call it reverential fear, if you want. And that just as you would, and he uses regularly the example of uh, a king, but he, he juxtaposes, for instance, the type of fear that we would have from like an Akrab, he mentions a scorpion, right? We fear scorpions because of the pain that it might inflict, that if it stings us. But we're not in awe of the scorpion. We fear the scorpion. But he mentions the example of the Sultan, a very powerful king. You are in awe of them, but you also fear because you know that they could that do something to you. So this awe is beyond ta'lim, it's beyond exaltation. And then we have two other meanings, presence of heart, understanding, exaltation, awe. Then we have hope, Raja. And this is clearly something else. And so he again goes back to the example of the king, is that you have these people, and again, we don't, in our context, it's very different. The only way we really know, we still kind of understand these metaphors because we see movies. And we see examples of people actually, you know, in movies going into the presence of a king and so forth. So we understand the concept and the purpose here is a, that, uh, a, a pedagogical tool to help us understand the meaning. And that you might fear that a king, uh, but at the same time, you might or might not have hope that they're going to actually do something good for you or at least not harm you. When it comes to Allah wa Ta'ala, we have ta'zim for him. We have haiba of him, but we also have hope. And just think about the beauty of this meaning is that everything else that we fear, we run away from. But our fear of Allah causes us to run towards Him in no anthropomorphic way. Everything else you fear, you want to avoid. But Allah, there's no escape. La melja, what a melja. There is no refuge and there is no safety from you except to you. SubhanAllah, that we seek refuge in his rida, from his sakhat, in his contentment, from his displeasure, and in his mu'afa, from his uquba, and from the, in his granting us well-being, from him punishing us, wa'udhu bika minka. 
We seek refuge in you, from you. SubhanAllah. And so Allah, we turn to him. SubhanAllah. And there's no greater manifestation of that meaning than on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah when everybody will be standing before Allah. And this is the day of justice. This is the day where all wrongs are righted. And the only one that can speak is Rasulullah. No one else can speak on that day except Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then because of the way he addresses Allah and how it is that he yastarham, he knows how to speak so that Allah Ta'ala's mercy will then unfold. And he says these beautiful, incredible ways of Muhammad, of praising Allah. And then that he's told, خلاص, ishfa' tu shafa'. Intercede and you'll be granted intercession. These are the type of qulub that you and I need. These are the type of hearts that we need. Especially in a time where look at how much fasad, how much that wrong there is in the world and what people are doing. Look at the state of the world and look at the oppression that's happening in the world. And look at what was happening to so many of our Muslim countries and just you could start listing, unfortunately, country after country. We need hearts that yastamti rahmatullah, that know how to be, that are means for the mercy of Allah to descend, to come down. These are the type of hearts that we need. And these are the type of hearts that have these meanings. The hearts are, of course, present. They understand what it is that they're reciting, but they have taught them for Allah wa ta'ala. They have haiba of Allah Ta'ala. But despite all of that, they have hope. They have hope. Because Allah wants His servant to have hope. And He wants His servant to have hope in Him. And our hope is in Allah. Our hope is in Allah. Not in our own abilities, in our own power or anything. Our hope is in Allah. And if He manifests that any of His names that of beauty is that that situation that outwardly we think that we've almost given up on or that are on the verge of despair will completely change instantaneously. He does whatever he wants to do. He raises and he lowers. He's the nafa and the dar. He is the one who benefits and he's the one who harms. And everything is totally 100% in his control. Even if people of dunya think that they're in charge, and think that they can manipulate the world through technology, Allah is in charge. They're not in charge. And He might let them do a little bit, but in the end, He's in charge. And just look at all the stories of the prophets. In the end, all of them were granted victory by Allah. Even that it seemed like it was grim, and it seemed like the other side was going to win. In the end, the prophets always win, because Allah grants them victory. And in the end, this is the state of the Ummah of our Prophet ﷺ. Despite now the state of Muslims, and even the wealthiest Muslim countries, that like in the Khalid for instance, combined they don't have a GDP like a smaller country in Europe. Just look at the state of poverty in Muslim countries all throughout the world. And what seems to be our powerlessness be in front of these technologically advanced countries with very powerful militaries that seemingly can do whatever it is that they want to do with us. In the end, this is Allah's affair. And all of this could shift in any given moment. The most important thing is that you and I learn how to be. We need hearts that know how to be means for, to bring about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy to His creation. This is how you and I need to be. And part of this relates to hope, having hope in Allah wa ta'ala. And then the last meaning that he speaks about is haya, and translated here as shame. And of course, shame is one of these words that we have to be very careful with. There are certain meanings that is used in a modern psychological context that we don't connect to a religious meaning. But here, this idea of being embarrassed before Allah because of what you've done. 
And that's the meaning here of shame, is that where we've done things where we realize we shouldn't have done them. Forget about the cultural context and being shamed in a cultural context. That's not what we're talking about here. Just put all that aside. This is shame before Allah, where you've done something shameful. You've done something reprehensible. You've done something blameworthy before Allah wa ta'ala. You've fallen short. And that is a very powerful meaning that we all have to have. And it relates very closely to another meaning of the heart, which is called inkisar, brokenness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when we combine these six meanings in prayer, this is what's going to give life to the prayer. These meanings are the ruh of salah. This is the spirit of the prayer. This is the life of the prayer. This is to the degree that we have these meanings will be to the degree which our prayer weighs heavily in the scales. The more we have the presence of these meanings in our prayer, the heavier that single prayer will be in the scales. And again, you could have two people do all of the same things and same things outwardly, but to the degree that one person or the other does or does not connect to these meanings will be to the degree which their prayer is accepted and heavy in the scales. So then what Imam Ghazali does, he talks about them in a little bit more detail about how it is that we can acquire these meanings. And this is really, really important. So he starts, of course, with Hudur al-Qalb, the inner state of presence of heart. And Imam Ghazali is very precise. He says, in the Hudur al-Qalb, sababahu al-Himma. The cause that will lead us to have presence of heart and prayer is our himma. What is our aspiration? And here you could even almost translate that as what is the direction of our heart? What it is, what is really important to us even? All of that's included in this meaning here of himma, which is essentially translated as our spiritual aspiration. Because he says, فَإِنَّ قَلْبَكْ تَابِعُنْ لِهَمَّكْ your heart will follow what it deems to be important. Your heart will follow what it gives preference to, what it is focused on. It's only going to be present with what you deem to be important. If something is important to you, your heart's going to be present whether you want to or not. So if you have someone sick and they're in the hospital and the doctor's coming out to you to give you the diagnosis of what's the state of the person, that's important to you. Are you going to be thinking about anything else? Are you going to be worried about what you're wearing? Are you going to be worried about the air conditioning? Are you going to be worried about you might not have slept in two days? You will be present with what the doctor says because it's important to you. Right? If your boss sends you an email about something that needs to be done, ASAP, are you going to be thinking about No, you're going to be preoccupied with that because that's what is important to you. So in other words, whatever is important to us, this is what will dictate whether we are focusing on something or not. It has to be important to us. And he says here, وَالْقَلْبِ إِذَا لَمْ يَحْضَرَ فِي الصَّلَاءِ لَمْ يُكُمْ مَتَّعْطِلًا Is that don't think that if your heart is not present with the meanings of the prayer, is that your heart is just going to remain idle. No. بَلْ جَائِلًا فِيهَا الْفِيمَ الْهَمَّةُ الْمَصْرُوفَةُ إِلَيْهَا مِنْ أَمُورُ الدُّنْيَا It's going to just roam in relation to everything that it thinks is important from the affairs of this world. So it's not like just you're just not present. No, you're preoccupied with whatever is important to you. Remember we said prayer is life. This is one of the greatest meanings. Prayer is life. How it is that we live manifests in your prayer. How it is that we live manifests in your prayer. And so he says that there is no way ultimately there is no cure or remedy to make yourself present in prayer except to direct your aspiration towards prayer. 
which is obvious. Prayer has to be your himma. So just look at the opposite where you're just delaying your prayer and you don't think it's important. You're not praying any of the sunnahs. You're praying by yourself. You're not, you know, even making sure to fulfill all of the adab and just praying very quickly and getting back to whatever it is that you're doing. Like how on earth do you ever expect to be present in your prayer? Now, if you're obviously traveling and this type of thing, the flight to catch in a rare circumstance, that's a separate situation. But that can't become the norm. Prayer has to be at the number one degree of importance. So when we hear that fudger clock go off or we have it on our phones or whatever else, how are we as people? Oh, I have plenty of time. I can pray later. Oh, it's daylight savings now. Oh, so I get lower in, you know, at four. I still got a whole hour until Asr. I'm good. Right? No, no. We should be like, I'm not going to relax and feel comfortable until I pray. Prayer time's in? Alas. This has to be the very first thing that I do. And especially young people, if you get used to that from now, there's no greater gift you can keep with you your entire life than that. Adhere to the prayer. And I guarantee you, if you make the prayer a priority, Allah will facilitate you in a wondrous way, ways for you to pray. Guaranteed. It's not my guarantee, but this is that something that is mujarrab and tested. If you live for Allah, Allah will facilitate everything for you. And so, there's no other solution other than to direct your himma, your aspiration towards prayer. But then he says, Is that you're never going to be able to direct your aspiration towards prayer unless that you are convinced that this is something that you actually need, that this is that in your own benefit. And that requires that we have iman. Belief is that the hereafter is better and more everlasting and everlasting. And that the prayer is the greatest means to attain that. And if you combine to that a knowledge of the lowliness of this world, then you will then be able to have presence of heart in your prayer. And he then goes on to say, is that if that doesn't make our heart present, is that we should know is that we have weak iman. So that, in other words, if we go through what he's saying here, is that we recognize the most important thing of all is the hereafter. And we believe in the hereafter. A belief so strong that we're motivated to prepare. And we recognize that the most important thing of all after testifying La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah is our prayer. And that's what we need for the hereafter. We all know that ilman, knowledge wise, but is that our state? And this is sometimes the disconnect. It's between what it is that we know in our state. And this is precisely why Imam Ghazali wrote the Hilum al was to close the gap between that disconnect between the mind, things that we know, and our inability to put it into practice and become our reality. This is what essentially with Intalik al Akhirah he's trying to remedy. And there is no more important place to do this than in prayer. It all gets back to this. And so, if going through that thought exercise doesn't help us, that means that we have weak iman. And it doesn't mean that we panic and throw in the towel. No, he says, <laughs> We have to then work, our duty then is, to work to strengthen our iman. He said, this is not the place for us to go into great detail about how to do that. He does that in different places in the Ihya, and there's ways, of course, to do that. But now we know the root cause that must be worked on. So he says here then, 
The next step here, after we've remedied this first in relation to our himma, our aspiration, what it is that we deem to be important, then the tafahum. How do we make ourselves that be present, but then also understand what it is that we are reciting? And he doesn't mention uh, the most outward and apparent aspect of this, which is to familiarize ourselves with what we recite in prayer and to learn the Arabic of it, to learn the translation of it, and to memorize it. All of that, I think he's assuming that people uh, have done or are actively doing. Uh, so that's a step that we have to take. Familiarize yourself with what you say in prayer. Learn the meanings of it in whatever language. And of course, you're saying in Arabic, but then you bring to heart the meaning of it, even if it's in a different language. And he says, is that the remedy for understanding is similar to the remedy for making our hearts present. But you add to that to focus what it is that you are reciting on and trying to understand it by the def al khawatir al shaghila is that you repel your inner speech that is trying to preoccupy you. The khawatir literally are thoughts. And you have to be careful. So you'll be in prayer and you'll be concentrating. Then all of a sudden, you'll think about something else. And then if you're not careful, it just takes you and it takes you and it takes you and it takes you and it takes you. And it takes you. Right? You're in prayer and all of a sudden you'll be like, I can't believe he said that. Can't believe she did that. Right? You're reciting, but then all of a sudden, and then it arouses an emotion. Right? Where you get like angry, or you get bothered, right? And you're in prayer. And the next thing you know, right? Or in the realm of sensory, is that we have to be careful about what we let into our senses. And there's a difference between just driving by and looking at a billboard and quickly looking down, as opposed to fixating our eyes on it. When you fixate your eyes on something from the sensory, it's much more likely to, you're much more likely to think about it. And so you might be in prayer, and then you just can't get that image out. I mean, all of us have prayed after watching a sports game or watching a movie or something like that. You're thinking about scenes in that movie. Uh, you're thinking about scenes in a movie in your prayer. We all know that, right? You know, if you try to pray at halftime for the NBA finals or the semifinals, right, you're thinking about what it is that you just saw. It's almost impossible not to. Even if you're focusing, it comes to your thoughts. So we have to be very careful with these types of things. And so what you have to do is, is that you have to deflect your inner speech. You have to protect yourself from what it is that you allow in. And most importantly, what it is that you see and what it is that you hear. Allah has given you eyes and he's given you eyelids. And you can look at something, boom. Immediately you lower your gaze. Yeah, that's how we should be. To all haram, anything that is disliking, dislike to Allah. You lower your gaze completely from it. And, and that actually might be physically lowering your gaze, or sometimes it means uh, whatever you have to do to turn away from it, sometimes it's just closing your eyes. But remember what Osset Amjad said, is that those thoughts that come to your heart, is that the quickness that we traverse on the surat, on the sirat, the traverse, is to the degree which we turn away from things that are displeasing to Allah. And then when our nafs is in a lower stage, your nafs might want to look at that thing. It might want to engage in that thing. But your mind like, no, I know it's bad for me. But your nafs is pulling you in that direction. And in that moment, there's nothing else you can do other than just to be strong, reliant upon Allah, and turn away. And then the more you do that, the easier it gets. That is the essence of deen. Right there, is, that's the essence of religiosity. Is in those moments where you're being pulled in a direction, just for Allah only to be strong and to resist. And sometimes it's hard. And sometimes you, it's like swallowing bitter medicine that you don't want to take. But there's nothing greater with Allah than that. And if you do that time and time again, it gets easier, and it gets easier, and it gets easier. And then you might slip, and then a tribulation comes your way that reminds you, La ilaha illallah, and then you get back on course. Okay. 
Allah is merciful, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so then he says here is that وَإِلَاجْ دَفْعِ الْخَوَاتَ الشاغرة, The way that we uh, remedy the thoughts that we have, which is really, you could also say your inner speech, although your thoughts include what your inner speech doesn't include, because your inner speech is really the thoughts of the ego, your egotistical thoughts from the nuts. Uh, but the other, the other khawatir include also the demonic insinuations, is that قَطْعُ مَوَادِهَا in other words, is that you uproot the sources of those various thoughts. And what he says here, what I mean by that is, is that looking at all of the means that once you uproot your connection to those things, is that the sources of those thoughts are now gone so that they are significantly less. And that gets down to the uh, meanings that we mentioned to you outwardly about being careful what we let in from the realm of the sensory but then he says at a deeper level as well is that our traits of the, the inner states that we have so he mentions here specifically mahabba what do we love فَمَنْ أَحَبَّ شَيْئًا أَكْثَرَ ذِكْرَ if you love something you will mention it often that's all there is to it if you love something you will mention it often. If you love California, you'll talk about California all the time. If you love spring, you'll talk about spring all the time. If you love a particular plant, that you'll probably get it in your home and talk about it and have it in your backyard all the time. You will speak often about what it is that you love. So in addition to the outward dimension, you also we also have to be careful about what it is that we let our heart, our hearts love. And that's not always so easy. That's a little bit amb ambiguous, the way that our aspiration is ambiguous. We have to work on that and to make sure that our heart loves what should be loved. But this is getting down. This is why, again, prayer is life. This is uncovering for us. And what a blessing. This is uncovering for us these things that are so fundamental to the human experience, of things that we absolutely need. So then, ta'lim. And he says that this is a state of heart that comes from two different types of knowledge. The first is the knowledge of the majesty of Allah and His greatness. So we have to learn about the majesty of Allah. We have to look at the explanation of the name of Allah, al alim the name of Allah, Al-Majid, all of these great names of Allah. And alhamdulillah, we even have translations of the Asma' al husna that we can learn about these great names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the great, the glorious, the jalali wa ikram, the possessor of majesty and generosity. And this is from the foundations of our faith. And that we think about one of the great ways to do this, and Imam Ghazali mentions this as a way to make your heart present in prayer. You think about everything that Allah created. And modern science actually helps us in that. I mean, you didn't need to be a scientist to reflect upon these matters ever, because it's enough just to think about what it is that you see. But now think about what it is that we know, not experientially, but some of it are through images, through the microscope or through the telescope, and some is it through mathematical equations, because math is the language of science, so we understand the vastness of Allah's creation and the 200 billion galaxies that are in our known universe and the incredible intergalactic distances that are out there, and just sh the sheer distance from planet Earth to the Sun, and how big Earth is, and that we are uh, rotating on our axis and orbiting the Sun, both of which is happening, moving extremely fast, but because Earth is so large, we don't feel it. We don't feel like we're even moving. This is amazing. And you start to think about all of these things, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is creating that and recreating it in every single moment. He's fully in charge of everything. That is amazing. That should strengthen your faith. And that should cause you to have ta'lim for Allah. The creator of the heavens and earth is the one you're standing before in that moment. And nothing centers you and nothing orients you more than praying to the Lord of the heavens and the earth. Outwardly, we orient ourselves towards the Kaaba. 
But inwardly, your orientation is towards Allah. What do? And in the Shafi school, we do the du'a the stiftah. The opening supplication is after saying Allahu Akbar Kabira, Alhamdulillah Kathira, then we go on to say, I have directed my essence, your wudj is your face, but it's also your internal essence, to the originator of the heavens and the earth. SubhanAllah. That's what we're doing when we stand up to pray. And so you go through these thought exercises to help you to have ta'zeem of Allah. But he says then also that you want to combine with that ma'rifatu haqaratin nafsi wa khissatiha you learn about the vile nature of, and the lowly nature of creation, but specifically that the human being. And this is again not to cause someone that uh, we don't want to misunderstand these things. Is that on one hand, is that we have hoped that we can attain something great, but when we talk about the nafs, that insofar as it started as a drop of fluid, insofar as is that it is totally insignificant. And there was a time where it was never even known that it's something lowly. And we know how we began and we know how it is that we'll end. And so from that perspective is that we don't see anything as being special except insofar as Allah has made it special. So this is our that view of all of creation, everything in creation. And he says then, What comes from, then emerges from these two types of knowledge, i.e. the knowledge of the greatness of Allah and the knowledge of that how his creation is in absolute need of him. And everything is subservient to him, including that human beings, of course. Is that then we have al-istikana, wal-inkisar, wal-khushur is that we are broken before Allah, we are lowly before Allah, we are reverent before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, this is ta'aleem. That state of being is ta'aleem. But again, is that we have to spend time with this and to reflect upon these things so that this becomes our state. Now, so then he goes on to talk about al hayba wal khawf awe and fear. And when someone comes to understand the power of Allah Ta'ala and what he calls the nafuz of mashi'atihi, how he imposes his will as he wants, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says here, and this is a hard pill to swallow, but it needs to be said. He said that were he to completely destroy all people, those who came before and those who will come at the end of time, it would not diminish his dominion the slightest bit, the weight of an atom. Allah is Allah. And that first movement of the heart where we think that we actually deserve to exist is one of is probably the source of all the problems we don't deserve to exist we do not deserve to exist if we feel entitled to our existence there is a long list of diseases of the heart that will arise from that feeling of entitlement that's deep this is very very deep and that when we start Yes, that when we talk about people who don't believe, there's a way of uh, speaking to them rationally. But oftentimes that we have to combine to that as well, spiritual meanings as well, to really help them understand. And usually that there's very few people that just through rational discourse that go from a particular belief to another. Something else must touch them deeper. And we start approaching this conversation and then Essentially, the essence of kufr and iman, of disbelief and belief, is built upon the willingness or the reluctance of the individual to submit to the Lord of the heavens and the earth and embrace 
their servitude before him or to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is at the crux and the very heart of the whole matter. And if someone's willing to accept that, but most people have so many layers of veils that are preventing them from accepting that, that you have to chop away, you have to chop away. Where you start to finally get to, mm, this is where it really lies. And you have to deal with that. And in the end, this whole affair is built upon submission. Allah says, Am lil insani ma tamanna. Will the human being have what it is that he wants? This is not our affair. This is an affair ultimately of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to happen. So by coming to understand this, and we see, and he actually mentions here, is he says that. He says, then you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends tribulations and all different types of difficulties to the prophets and the awliya. Even though he's all powerful and he could prevent that all from happening, subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the nature of the dunya. And this is, strengthens our iman now. Because Allah is all-powerful. Everything that's happening to the ummah, the unimaginable things that are happening to believers right now, Allah is all-powerful. He could prevent it from happening. But there's a wisdom. There's a wisdom in it happening. In addition to the sharia dimension of disliking what Allah has commanded us to dislike and doing what it is that you can, this is the other side of the same coin that must be there for us to maintain our sanity, but also to respond in a way that is pleasing to Allah. Everything is from Allah. He could repel it if he wanted to, subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a wisdom behind it. And as Imam Hassad says, he has a book of aphorisms, and the very first aphorism is, is that all of creation is either in the da'irat al-Rahmah or the da'irat al-Hikmah in this world. They're either in the circle of wisdom or in the circle, in the circle of mercy or in the circle of wisdom. And then he said, those who are in the circle of mercy in this world will receive the fadl of Allah, his bounty in the next world. Those who are in the circle of wisdom in this world will receive his adal, his justice in the next world. So this reflecting upon these realities that helps us attain the state of hayba. And then raja. Is that we come to understand the lutf of Allah, His benevolence, that His subtle generosity, that subhanahu wa ta'ala, His gentleness, and in His karam, His generosity, and His amim and ami, His that wide reaching, that giving of blessings and all of the subtleties of everything that is that he's created. And knowing the promise that he's given for the people uh, that, who, that do what they've been commanded to do to attain paradise and so forth. And so that when we attain yaqeen, certainty, in relation to his promise, and the knowledge that we have of his lutf, is that then we'll have to have hope in Allah. We have to have hope in Allah. And so again, we're combining between these different meanings. But when we that think, when we hear about His mercy, we see in His creation that all of these manifestations of His benevolence. And if you want a practical way to help you understand that, I would encourage you to be very practical here. Uh, get Imam Ghazali's translation. Uh, get the translation of Imam Ghazali's book, and Maqsad al-Asna, the highest aim. And read the description of the name of Allah, Al-Latif. And then, read Surat Yusuf, and try to understand it as a manifestation of the name of Allah, Al-Latif. And then look how Allah says towards the end of Surah, Allahu Al-Latifun, Lima Yasha'u. And connect the meaning of Surah Yusuf to the name of Allah Latif. And this will help you understand this particular meaning. 
And then the final one is Al-Haya. And the way we do this is going through this thought exercise of realizing how we fall short in worship and how we're unable to f f fully that uphold the haq, the right that Allah Taala has upon ourselves. And we combine with that a knowledge of our faults and that all the things that we've done wrong and how we're inclined into the things of this world is that when we reflect upon those things, necessarily is that we will have a state of shame come before Allah, that we will be the embarrassed before Allah. And of course, that have modesty before him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then he says, فَحَادِي أَسْبَابَ حَادِي سِفَاتِ These are the ways to attain these various inner states of prayer. And he says, وَكُلُّ مَا طَرِبَ تَحْسِرُوا فَعِلَاجُ إِحْبَارُ سَبَبِهِ Is that if you want to attain any of these states, you have to go about the causes that will then lead to them. And that the various thought exercises that he mentioned. And he says that, the remedy is known through knowing the cause. What links all these means is Iman, faith, and Yaqeen, certitude. In other words, is that the more that we strengthen our Iman, the more certitude that we have, the easier that it will be for us to attain all of these meanings because again, prayer is life. And he quotes this beautiful narration that Sayyidah Aisha, that she said, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يُحَدِّثُنَا وَنُحَدِّثُ The Prophet وسلم, would speak to us and we would speak to him. And the Prophet was very close to people. He was like anyone else in the house when he was at home, even though he's not like anyone else, not only in the house, in the entire cosmos. But this is how he was. He was approachable. He was very easy. He would sweep the floor, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would cut meat. He would milk his sheep. He would bend and tend to his affairs, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would help around the house that he would mend his own sandals and so forth. He was very approachable. Anyone could that speak to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would speak to them. And that if they would speak about worldly affairs, he would speak about worldly affairs. He would remind them at the same time about the hereafter. And they used to say, كان يتخولنا الموعدة From time to time he would admonish us. Right? Because if you just tell someone day in and day out, you tell your kids seven, eight times a day, da, 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 da. They just eventually, let's go deaf to what you're saying. Right? You have to, can he? Know when to say what and to what degree and so forth. But, فَإِذَا حَضْرَةَ الصَّلَاةَ فَكَأَنَّهُ لَمْ يَعْرِفْنَا وَلَمْ نَعْرِفْنَا but once it came time for prayer, it was as if he did not know us and we did not know him. This is the time to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the degree that we reflect these meanings, these six inner states uh, of prayer in the heart will be to the degree that we are giving the prayer that it's haq. And that in closing, there's this beautiful statement, Imam al that includes part of it, but it's originally from Qut al-Qulub. They say, in the abd, yuhshur and al mot min qabri ala hayatihi fi salata. This is sufficient of proof and a motivating factor for us to take prayer seriously. A servant will be raised after death from his grave according to his hayah, how he was in prayer. Min is sukun utumanina. To what degree were they present in their prayer? And such that they had stillness and tranquility in their prayer. So imagine, Yom al Qiyamah, which is subjectively from two light rakats to 50,000 years, people experience it somewhere in that realm. Is that your raha, your repose, your repose on the Day of Judgment will be according to that your repose in prayer. In other words, that the more that we have tana'am, that we actually enjoy praying, the more that we find pleasure in praying, the more that we are comfortable praying, the more that we that have presence of heart in our prayer, that will directly translate on Yom Al-Qiyamah 
to how it is that we experience that day. The more repose we have in prayer, the more repose on Yom Qiyamah. Is that the more that we enjoy our prayers, the less that we'll fear on Yom Qiyamah and Hakkadah. It directly relates to how we are in prayer. What are we in a ma'nahala? And Abi Hurair, this is a mokuf, that meaning that is narrated by one of the Sahaba, by uh, that Abu Hurairah. And Imam Musa says, Walaqad Sadaq. So he's told the truth. And then he quotes the meaning of a hadith. The hadith is Sahih Muslim. Yub'ath kullu abdan ala ma mata alayh. Every servant will be raised according to how it is that they died. Right? Their state of when they died will be how they're raised. And so that if we love prayer and enjoy prayer and start to find the halawa in the sweetness of prayer and find pleasure in the prayer, the way we experience Yom Qiyamah is going to be very different than the way we've experienced it were we to have been deficient in that. So this is why we come together to study these meanings in hopes that we attain something of the reality by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah ta'ala give us tawfiq and to us, us to understand and to give us all of these inner states of the prayer in ways that he gifts the elect of the awliya and the salihin. May Allah ta'ala have mercy upon all of us, forgive us all our sins and to remove all of the veils and all the obstacles between us and attain degrees of closeness to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammadin wa alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. I apologize for going over. And we will continue back, as I understand, uh, after Salah at 1.45, correct?